Welcome back everyone. In this module's second micro lecture, we're going to turn our attention to prescription drugs and how those drugs are regulated differently than over-the-counter ones. Additionally, we will review their potential for abuse and some of the issues that exist with big pharma corporations. Let's go ahead and get started. For this micro lecture, we're going to be turning our attention to prescription drugs. This is a big industry and for many of us, a very expensive aspect of our lives. So we're using a lot of prescription drugs and there has to be, there is something to treat basically everything at this point. Have a rash, use this cream. Have an earache, try these eardrops. Have bl high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Well, we have something that's gonna help bring both of those down. As of this recording, the FDA has over 20,000 active market drugs approved for marketing. The FDA estimates that for a five-year average, they approve roughly 49 new prescription drugs every year. This is inclusive of individual drugs, meaning the brand name drug and its generic equivalent that are available in a potential, a variety of different doses. In 2021, the U.S. spent a total of $603 billion on prescription drugs, in addition to the $4.8 billion we spent on over-the-counter ones. Sometimes our insurance covers the majority of that cost for us, but depending on the drug, it might not cover anything at all. Additionally, some of those prescription drugs can dra be drastically expensive, forcing some Americans to decide whether they're going to purchase these, their meds and still get their bills paid. Remember, as we stated earlier, that the Durham-Humphrey Amendment to the Food and Drug Act required that certain drugs need a prescription while others did not. So this law categorized drugs based on dependency issues. If it was habit forming, then it should be supervised by a doctor, meaning it's not safe for self-medication. Or if it was brand new, then it would need to be a prescription drug. This law also allowed for the refill of prescription medications for the first time ever. Now you don't have to go back to the doctor every single month to get a brand new prescription every time your pill bottle is empty unless your prescription is for a controlled substance. Many new drugs still fall into this categorization. If it is new, then they require a prescription unless it was specifically designed as an over-the-counter drug, but it still needs FDA approval before it can be sold. As we continue to approve new drugs, we are continuously opening the door to increase potential for abuse of these substances. Obviously, one of our biggest concern over the last couple of years has been the amount of prescription painkillers we prescribe every year. Many of them are highly habit-forming and have dependence concerns. In 2020, over 142 million prescriptions were written for opioid-based painkillers. The total cost of the opioid epidemic is costing us roughly $1.5 trillion per year when taking things like treatment, overdose, hospital stays, incarceration, and more into account. In terms of abuse, we are really concerned about the abuse of opioid painkillers. People are selling them on the black market and trying to make a profit that way. But the biggest concern we're facing right now is not just the abuse of these specific drugs, but the increased reliance on stronger opioid drugs when the original prescriptions stop working or when the effect is diminished. This has in turn helped to fuel the flames when it comes to heroin use in this country. Prescription painkillers are often the jumping off point for heroin use today. In an effort to help turn around some of the unintended consequences of overprescribing opioid products, Many states have passed legislation that require the elimination of refills for these pills, quantity limitations, regulation on prescription by dosage, and more. This has led to a shutdown of many pain clinics and has forced patients to begin doctor hopping to find increased access to the drugs. Many insurance providers stop covering the drugs when the doctor hopping begins in an attempt to limit patient access to opioids. Instead, this forces the patient to pay completely out of pocket 
or turn to the black market. In addition to the official use for these drugs, people are also using prescription drugs to supplement other behaviors and symptoms associated with illicit drug use that they may be engaging in. For example, they may need help with withdrawal from something else. Remember that when people are withdrawing from heroin, they mean, may need to go on methadone to help with the withdrawal process so they don't die from a lack of heroin in their bodies. They may also need antibiotics to help treat infections that may come from the use of intravenous drug use. As an injection site gets infected, it needs to be treated. Or perhaps the user has contracted hepatitis or HIV AIDS from needle sharing. Now those conditions have to be uh, treated by prescription drugs as well. Additionally, the individual might be using a prescription drug as a supplement for another drug. For example, if our opioid user is already using heroin, they may chase it with some oxy to make their opioid high stronger and more pronounced. No matter why the individual is engaging in prescription drug use, the complications that can come from illicit use can be extreme and in some cases deadly. Years of use can take a toll on our bodies overall. To end our lecture today, I want to spend a few minutes discussing what happens when things get out of hand with Big Pharma. One of the hot button issues of the last decade has been the out of pocket cost a lot for a lot of these different drugs. I want to discuss two issues in particular as we end this discussion. The first case study uh, regards a drug called Daraprim that was produced by Turing Pharmaceuticals. Daraprim is an antiparasitic drug approved to treat toxoplasmosis. The drug is also used as a second level defense drug for HIV patients. Turing Pharmaceuticals purchased the patent and all the rights to the drug in 2015. When that happened, the company became the sole provider of the drug, making it a single source item. You probably know where I'm about to go with this. Once Daraprim became a single source drug, the CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals, Martin Schicrelli, decided that it would be an excellent idea to raise the price in 2015. Schicrelli decided to increase the price of the drug from $13.50 per pill to $750 per pill. This was a 5,455% increase in the price of that particular medication. For the average user of this medication, a person on a 75 milligram dose rose, from about, rose to about $75,000 a month with the increase from the $13 tablet to the $750 tablet. At the time, the FDA had not approved a generic version of the drug, so there was nothing to stand in Shikrelli's way and did not allow patients to seek any other alternatives. Shikrelli actually then had the nerve to defend his behavior by implying that he had done nothing wrong in this instance and that the market was free for a reason. With pressure coming from the medical community and from Americans in general, the company decided to offer patient assistance programs to help patients afford the drug. However, initially, Turing Pharmaceuticals declined to lower the price of their medication. The price increase has been fiercely criticized by physician groups such as HIV Medicine Associates and the Infectious Diseases Society of America. In India, a pharmaceutical company can manufacture a near identical version of this medication and charges between four cents and 10 cents per pill. In the UK, it's about 66 cents per pill. And in Brazil, <coughs> excuse me, this pill actually costs about two cents. So if these companies were able to make the pill so cheaply and offered it to citizens at a fair and decent price, why wasn't America? By, 2000, by late 2015, competitor companies had developed a generic version of Daraprim, which was ultimately approved by the FDA. This was part of the reason why Turing's board of directors decided to let Shikrelli go from the company. The other reason they fired him? The FBI arrested him on charges of security fraud 
as it related to the price increase. He was convicted in 2017, incarcerated, and eventually released in 2022. As a way to help mitigate some of the destruction caused by the price increase, Turig uh, lowered the price of the pill to $375 in 2016. The second case study that I want to address is in regards to insulin. As you're probably aware, insulin is prescribed to those individuals who cannot naturally produce enough insulin on their own, resulting in diabetes. Insulin is over 100 years old. It was first developed and prescribed in 1921, and it provided a cure to type 1 diabetes, which was often seen as a death sentence before this development. Eli Lilly and company became the first mass producer of insulin in the United States. As of 2023, it was estimated that 8.7 Americans use insulin daily to treat insulin deficiencies. However, not all individuals diagnosed with diabetes are required to use insulin. In 1996, Eli Lilly made a large advancement in the production of insulin when it de debuted a fast-acting type of insulin. At the time of its release, the vial of this new type of insulin cost $21. As of 2018, that same vial of insulin now costs a patient $98.70. This substantial increase has been consistent over the years and has created a significant health crisis for those who are unable to afford this pricing. In a recent 2022 study, Yale researchers have concluded that insulin is providing an extreme financial burden for some Americans. According to their findings, 14% of people who use insulin in the United States face what we call or what we describe as catastrophic levels of spending on insulin, meaning that they are spending at least 40% of their post-substance income, what is available after paying for food and housing, on insulin. Insulin costs the, mo costs the most in the U.S. compared to any other country worldwide. There has been intense political and corporate pressure, along with calls from patients who are calling for pharmaceutical companies to reduce the cost of insulin and cap it at $35. This was made official for those on Medicare at the beginning of 2023 when legal changes required this cap for all of those who use Medicare or Medicaid insurance. In his 2023 State of the Union address, President Biden called for the same $35 cap. On March 1, 2023, Eli Lilly, who was the original mass producer of in insulin, agreed to cap its cost at $35. The cap automatically applies to people with private insurance. People without insurance will be eligible as long as they sign up for Eli Lilly's copay assistance program. Later that same month, Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana and Raphael Warnock from Georgia co-sponsored the Bipartisan Affordable Insulation now, Insulin Now Act of 2023 to cap the price of insulin for all patients, including those who are uninsured, at $35 for a 30-day supply. At the time of this recording, the bill has not made any progress beyond its initial introduction to Congress. A formally mandated cap would help millions of Americans to be able to afford their medication and ease some of the financial burdens associated with this drug. It only costs between three and six dollars to produce a vial of insulin. So even at $35, there's still plenty of profit to be made. With these huge profits at stake, it makes sense that companies would want to take advantage and make the most money possible. However, is there a moral and ethical obligation for these corporations to help patients when they have the ability to do so? Should they be required to? Does the government even have the right or responsibility to force corporations to do the right thing when it comes to price inflation or price gouging? These are some of the questions that we need to discuss and think about as they apply to all types of medication and drug use throughout the semester. As we wrap up this micro lecture, I wanna leave you with the idea that drug use is a complex issue 
and is not just a black and white one anymore. Over the years, opinions on drug use, whether licit or illicit in nature, have seen some shifts. We trust doctors more than we ever have in the past. There is a variety of medications available that can save our lives, and when we used to die to, di when we used to, die to diseases that we didn't need to die from. Childhood vaccinations save lives and prevent things like polio, but it wasn't always this way. We didn't trust the doctors because they didn't have the technologies to treat us like they do today. But even still, there's a portion of society that chooses to self-medicate and treat their symptoms on their own. That's not always a bad thing, but when the symptoms and the pr uh, need prescription treatment, science has provided us with some pretty amazing cures. However, are we always doing the responsible thing when it comes to our citizens by letting the free market dictate the price of these drugs? Or do we have a broader responsibility to make sure that citizens have access to these drugs above all things? Next up, we'll begin a discussion regarding the central nervous system depressant drugs and the effects that those have on our bodies. I'll see you there.